A very good evening viewers and aspirants. Welcome to the Hindi News Analysis brought to you by Shankara Ice Academy. Today we'll be covering the Hindi News edition dated 30th of May 2022 and these are the articles I have taken today. In my last discussion I promised you that I'll be taking a previous questions. Yes, I have taken two previous questions in the same area. I have discussed these questions in the practice question session. So pay attention to all these discussions so that you can also answer the quiz question at the end of the practice questions. Now let us get to the first news article discussion. So now let us take up this news article for our first discussion. The news article mentions that one man has died from West Nile fever. This has happened in the state of Kerala and according to the news article as of now no other cases of this fever has been reported so far. Few days ago we saw about a monkeypox virus and now this fever is in news so it is important to know about it let us see that now see this west nile fever is caused by a virus called west nile virus this virus belongs to the genus flavivirus actually even the japanese encephalitis virus is also of the same family now this virus and the disease are named after the district of uganda which is west nile This is where the virus was first isolated in the year 1937. Okay, that is why the virus is named as West Nile virus. So now, where this virus is commonly found, it is found in Africa, Europe, Middle East, North America, and West Asia. Now, well, let us see how this virus is transmitted. Then we'll see the symptoms. So, regarding this virus, birds are the natural hosts or the natural carriers, and they are transmitted through mosquito bites. so the mosquitoes become infected when they feed on the infected birds and once these mosquitoes become infected they transmit the virus to humans through mosquito bites and note that the transmission to human beings is mainly caused by a type of mosquito called as culex mosquito and that is why we say the west nile virus causes a mosquito borne disease we'll see what is the disease later now this virus can spread further due to contact with other infected animals especially their bloods or other tissues then what about human to human transmission actually there is no documentation of casual contact human to human uh, transmission casual contact refers to the contact between people without sharing of blood or body fluids so casual contact transmission is not yet documented among humans and even the documented information about sexual transmission is also less but we cannot say that it will not happen other than that the virus is also spread by blood transfusion and organ transplantation and it is also spread from mother to baby during pregnancy during delivery or through breastfeeding so the virus transmission mainly involves either the blood or through body fluids but also remember that it is not spread through coughing sneezing or touching or through touching live animals or from handling live or dead infected birds it is also not spread through eating infected animals there is a need for direct sharing of blood or body fluids as we just saw so this is how this virus is transmitted it is naturally transmitted among birds and mosquitoes and to humans it is transmitted through mosquitoes only other than humans horses are also infected by this virus now this virus is actually dangerous because it can cause two types of diseases first one is the west nile neuroinvasive disease this is a fatal neurological disease among humans because this disease affects the central nervous system and it leads to meningitis encephalitis acute flaccid paralysis etc and also about 1 out of 10 people who develop severe illness which affects the central nervous system actually die that is why we say it is fatal other than this disease the virus also causes the west nile fever So West Nile fever is a mosquito borne disease remember that actually about 20% of West Nile virus infections in humans may cause West Nile fever only less than 1% may cause the West Nile neuroinvasive disease now if we come to the symptoms of West Nile fever which is of our concern today so this fever is characterized by sudden onset of symptoms like headache then malaise or which means uneasiness then fever there is also muscle pain which is called as myalgia then vomiting then rash fatigue eye pain etc and the severity of these symptoms ranges from a mild illness for a week to a prolonged weakening for months but the fact to be noted regarding this west nile fever and its symptoms is that 80% of the people who are infected with the west nile virus will not show any symptoms so there is a lot of chance that this disease may go unnoticed 
and that is why it leads to sudden outbreaks. But then how to save ourselves from being infected with this virus or how to detect the presence of this virus? See, its presence can be detected by tracking the bird deaths and also deaths of horses. It is because when birds get infected with this virus, they die due to illness. So bird deaths acts as a marker for the transmission of this virus. And also the outbreaks in birds or animals precede human cases. So if there is an active animal health surveillance system in a country, then it is easy to detect new cases in birds and horses, which will enable to prevent an outbreak in humans. Other than this, the main key to prevent the spread of this West Nile fever or West Nile virus is to control mosquito populations. So how this West Nile fever is treated? Actually, there is no vaccine available to prevent West Nile virus transmission in people. And there are also no curing medications available to treat this virus. Only supportive treatment is available, which can help in reducing some of the symptoms. But cure is not available. And that is why it is crucial to know the spread of this disease, because sometimes it is fatal also. So what you can do is, you can take certain measures to reduce the risk of this West Nile virus. You can use mosquito repellent. You can wear long sleeve shirts and long pants to prevent mosquito bites. Because in humans, West Nile virus is transmitted through mosquitoes, especially Culex mosquitoes. So these are few facts that you have to know about West Nile fever and West Nile virus. Let us move on to the next discussion. Let us take up this news article. Actually, this article mentions about certain statements made by our Prime Minister about unicorns. See here, we are not talking about the legendary mythical creature that has a single large pointed spiraling horn projecting from its forehead. But we are talking about startup companies. While addressing a meeting, a Prime Minister has noted certain facts about the unicorn startups in our country. He has said that the number of uh, unicorn startups in our country has reached 100. And the total valuation of these unicorns is more than $330 billion. That is more than 25 lakh crore rupees. Another fact to be noted is that out of these 100 unicorns, 44 came up just last year. And this year, we are expecting 14 more unicorns to be formed. So from this, what we can infer is that in the global pandemic and when the economy is trying to recover, our startups have been doing a great business and they have been creating wealth and value. So let us understand what are these unicorns and their significance. See, as he said, unicorns are a type of startup companies. So first let us know what is a startup company. See, startup refers to a company in the first stages of its operation. That is, it is a young company which is established by one or more entrepreneurs to create unique and irreplaceable products and services. And the main aim behind a startup is to bring in innovation. So when a privately held startup company has a value of over $1 billion, then we call it as a unicorn. So when the startup has a value of over $1 billion, it is a unicorn startup. So this term was first popularized by a venture capitalist, Eileen Lee. He is the founder of Cowboy Ventures. So in this way, we know that some of the examples of unicorns in India include Paytm, Misho, Urban Company, etc., etc., but you have to also remember that the value of these unicorns is generally based on how investors and venture capitalists feel they will grow and develop. So its value is typically based on long-term forecasting. This means their valuation have nothing to do with their financial performance. In fact, many of these companies rarely generate any profits when they first get running. Now, why these unicorns are significant? First, because they bring in disruptive innovation. What is a disruptive innovation? It is the introduction of a product or service into an established industry and such a product or service performs better and generally it is at a lower cost than existing offerings. So such a product displaces the market leaders in that particular market space and it transforms that particular industry. If you take mobile phones, it itself is a disruptive technology or disruptive innovation because nowadays smartphones have replaced laptops and desktops regarding the computing needs, including browsing and streaming also. So in this way, mobile phones, especially the smartphones, they are disruptive innovations. So this is first significance. Now second, the business model of unicorns is driven by the latest technological innovations and trends. Because just now we saw that they bring in disruptive innovation, right? So in this way, it fulfills the latest demands of the market. And thirdly, these unicorns are consumer focused. 
that is their goal is to simplify things for consumers and to be a part of their day to day life and fourth point is the innovation provided by unicorns are affordable because as i already said in the first point disruptive innovation means providing a product or service at a lower cost than the existing ones so in this manner those products and services become affordable and most importantly these unicorns are privately owned and these privately owned unicorns get their valuation bigger when an established company invests in it so such an investment increases the innovation projects also so these are the few facts that you have to know about unicorn startups with these points in mind now let us get to the next discussion okay now let us take up this news article it talks about unreasonable bail conditions imposed by the high court see the bail conditions imposed by the high courts makes us question that whether personal liberty hinges on the whims of individual judges this question arises mainly because in many instances the discretion of individual judges has decided the bail for example even last year in madhya pradesh the high court allowed bail to a suspected molester provided that he visited his victim at her home and allowed her to tie a rakhi on him so supreme court took cognizance of this matter and it struck down this judgment of madhya pradesh high court Here, Supreme Court mentions that using rakhi tying as a condition for bail transforms a molester into a brother by a judicial mandate. So, similarly, in many cases, the personal whims of the High Court judges played as a condition in providing bail, and that is why today we are going to see about bail, its types, and why do we need bail. See, bail denotes provisional release of accused for whom trial is pending. here you should focus on the term provisional release the accused is not permanently released rather it is a provisional release and since the trial is pending that means the court is yet to announce the judgment so even though the accused person is in a provisional release that is the accused is not in a prison after the judgment the accused person may be acquitted or even sentenced by the court Now the section in our Indian law that deals with the provisions of bail are section 436 and section 437 of Code of Criminal Procedure CRPC. In this section 436 deals with provisions of bail in bailable offence. See under this section bail is the right of a person who has been accused for commission of an offence which is bailable in nature. So this provision casts a mandatory duty on police official as well as on the court to release the accused on bail if the offence alleged to be committed by that person is bailable in nature. So what are some of the uh, common bailable offences according to Indian Penal Code? It includes, you know, a simple hurt, bribery, public nuisance, etc. These are bailable offences. So if you are alleged of any of these crimes, you can apply for bail. Now, if we come to section 437, this section deals with the provisions of bail in non-bailable offences. Yes, there are also offences which are called as non-bailable offences. That is, here the offence is itself non-bailable in nature. We saw that bail is a right for accused in case of bailable offence, but in case of non-bailable offences, it is up to the discretion of the courts on whether to give bail or not. So, it is not a right here. so if there is a statement which says bail is a right of the individual now this is a common statement so it is incorrect bail is a right only if the offence is bailable offence now you should also know that there are three types of bail according to our indian law they are regular bail interim bail and anticipatory bail if you take regular bail it is a direction given by the court to release a person who is already under arrest and kept in police custody so the accused is under police custody so and the court is directing to release that person provisionally so that means in case of a regular bail a person can file a bail application and this is filed under section 437 and section 439 of crpc now then what is anticipatory bail it is a direction issued to release a person on bail even before the person is arrested that is if any person has reason to believe that he or she may be arrested for a non bailable offence then they can apply for anticipatory bail here anticipatory means they have anticipated in advance itself that they may be arrested so to prevent themselves from being arrested they apply for this kind of bail and note that this bail is issued only by the sessions court and high court and this bail application that is anticipatory bail application is filed under section 438 of crpc Then what about the interim bail? So this is the bail that is granted for a short period of time. 
this bail is granted before the hearing for the grant of a regular bail or anticipatory bail. So these are the three main types of bail available in India. Now, you should also remember that this bail is not applicable until, you know, the judgment is uh, delivered. It can be cancelled in between. Under section 437 and 439 of CRPC, the courts have the power to cancel the bail after the bail is provided. And under these provisions, the court can give directions to the police officer to arrest the person and keep the person in police custody. So now let us come to the point of why do we need bail. The first and foremost is when a person is granted bail, you know, that means the person is released from prison but provisionally. So that means the personal liberty of that person is no more curtailed. So bail is necessary to protect an individual's personal liberty. And secondly, it is not always that a person is arrested based on true accusations. The reasons could be false also. So these are the two main reasons as to why we need bail. I hope you had a clarity about bail in general. We'll know more about it when uh, the Supreme Court pronounces its judgment regarding the conditions of bail. Now let us move on to the next discussion. So now let us take up this news article for discussion. It says that the Bengaluru Regional Office of UIDAI has withdrawn a notification due to a controversy. See, this notification asked people not to share photocopies of their Aadhaar card saying that it could be misused. But we can see that this notification is contrary to what the central government said before. Because on multiple occasions, the central government as well as the UIDA authority has publicly proclaimed many times that without biometric information, other details could not be used to impersonate a person. Even central government once said that Aadhaar is an identity document, so by its very nature, it needs to be shared openly with others whenever required. So we can clearly see that the notification in question which advised people against sharing photocopies of Aadhaar is contrary to the previous stand of the government. Along with this, the notification also advised people from using uh, any public computer to download electronic versions of the Aadhaar. So by realizing the contradictory nature of this notification, now this notification has been withdrawn which is what the news is today. And since prelims is in four days, I am going to take this opportunity to revise few important facts about Aadhaar. First of all, this Aadhaar or Aadhaar number is a 12-digit individual identification number. This number is issued by UIDAI, that is Unique Identification Authority of India. It issues the number on behalf of the Government of India. And as you know, UIDAI is a statutory authority that is established under the Aadhaar Act of 2016. And it functions under the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology. What is this Aadhaar Act of 2016? It is the Aadhaar Targeted Delivery of Financial and Other Subsidies, Benefits and Services Act of 2016. In short, we call it as Aadhaar Act of 2016. Now, this act only provides the legal backing for Aadhaar. Now, coming back to the Aadhaar number, it serves as a proof of identity and address anywhere in India. So, remember that Aadhaar number is just a proof of identity and it does not confer any right of citizenship or domicile in respect of an Aadhaar number holder. So, just because you hold Aadhaar number does not mean that you have the right of citizenship or domicile. But why do we need Aadhaar number? See, it establishes uniqueness of every individual on the basis of certain information like demographic information and biometric information. So, it provides a credible identity. Here, uh, demographic information could mean your name, date of birth, age, address, etc. And biometric information could mean the fingerprints, iris scans, facial photograph, etc. Also remember that Aadhaar is a voluntary service that every resident can avail irrespective of present documentation. This was uh, reiterated by Supreme Court also that it is a voluntary service and it could not be a mandatory one. Another importance of this other number is that it helps the residents to avail various services that are provided by banking, mobile number connections and uh, other government and non-government services in due course. So now comes the question of who can apply for it. That is who is eligible to obtain other number. See, actually, any individual irrespective of their age and gender can obtain it and they have to be a resident in India. And they also have to satisfy the verification process that is laid down by the UIDI authority. Here, the resident of India has been defined in the Aadhaar Act. It means an individual who has resided in India for a period which amounts to 182 days or more. 
and these 182 days should be in 12 months which is immediately preceding the date of application for enrollment so this is when you are applying for aadhar as a resident in india now apart from residents in india even the nris that is non resident indians can also avail aadhar see this provision was particularly included in 2019 only it was included through a notification according to this a non resident indian after her or his arrival in india is entitled to obtain an aadhar number now here don't get confused that whether nri becomes a resident in and after arriving in india no it is not because an nri has been defined differently in the act according to the act nri is a person who is a citizen of india and holding a valid indian passport but not a resident as defined in the act so if you are a nri and if you want aadhar number then you should have a valid indian passport it is accepted as proof of identity proof of address and date of birth here indian passport is mandatory as proof of identity but for proof of address and date of birth you can also provide other documents mentioned by the authority so residents of india as well as nris can avail aadhar number and also note that individuals they have to enroll only once but if there is multiple enrollment then the duplicates will be rejected further aadhar enrollment is free of cost for all the residents of india and as well as for the nris So what about the validity of such an enrollment see this other number is unique for each individual as i already said so it remains valid for a lifetime but do we have only physical copy of aadhar no apart from this we have two other categories of aadhar one is e aadhar and uh, another one is mast aadhar instead of physical copy you can also use the e aadhar this e aadhar is a password protected electronic copy of aadhar and it is digitally signed by the competent authority of ui dai and if you come to masked aadhar this is a option which allows you to mask your aadhar number in your downloaded e aadhar that is a part of the aadhar number that 12 digit is masked So how many numbers is masked the first eight digits of aadhar number is masked with some characters like xxx and only the last four digits of this aadhar number are visible so these are few facts that you need to know about aadhar number we already have a previous question regarding aadhar i'll discuss it at the practice questions discussion session now let us move on to the next discussion now let us take up this data point for discussion it provides us with the data from the recent national achievement survey findings See, according to the survey, due to the pandemic, the marks scored by the Indian school students in the examination conducted by the National Achievement Survey has declined significantly. The decline could be seen across classes and in most of the subjects. So, let us see what is this National Achievement Survey, and we'll also see some of the important data from the data point. The syllabus relevant to this discussion is highlighted here. You can go through it. See, this National Achievement Survey is a survey to assess the students' learning outcome. and this survey comes under the ministry of education now the framework that determines the students learning outcome has been developed by ncert that is national council of educational research and training and based on this framework only the learning outcomes are assessed now this is a national level survey but it is conducted by cbse that is central board of secondary education the framework has been developed by ncert but it is conducted by cbse and also know that this survey covers the state government schools government aided schools private unaided recognized schools and also the central government schools so what is the object behind this survey it is to assess the learning gap and to evaluate students competencies in this way the survey helps to identify the efficiency of the education system of our country so for this which are all the classes and which are all the subjects targeted the targeted classes are class 3 5 8 and 10 and the subjects that are targeted differ in each of these classes for example in class 3 and 5 the subjects which are monitored include uh, indian language environmental studies and then mathematics and for class 8 indian language mathematics science and social science is monitored and for class 10 english is also monitored with these four subjects so before seeing the findings of the survey let us see why the survey is significant as you know the right to education act was passed in the year 2010 After this the gross enrollment ratio has been rising in our country. This is because the act increased the accessibility of education. But the issue is the learning outcome in India has been on the decline. This was noted by many survey reports for example it was even highlighted by the annual status of education report that is the assr report. 
The 13th Asar report even noted that only 73% of class 8 students can read and understand class 2 level text. So you can see that learning outcomes have not been achieved at all. So through the national assessment surveys, the government can diagnose the learning gaps of students and it can also determine interventions that are required in educational policies, teaching practices and learning. So overall, the NAS findings help the government in designing capacity building for teachers also and officials who are involved in delivery of education. So these are the two significance of NAS. Along with this, since school education is the foundation over which the rest of the academic uh, capacity of the student is built, a good school education is highly necessary. Plus, India has a positive demographic dividend and to use this productively, human capital must be efficient also. And to increase this efficiency, a strong foundational school education is required. So, in this way, the NAS surveys help in ensuring the incremental learning outcome from the schools. So now let us come to the NAS survey 2021. Look at this graph here. This graph shows the mean marks that were scored in 2017-18 survey and 2021 survey. It shows the mean marks scored across all classes and in all subjects that have been taken up for the survey. Here the grey dot represents the 2017-18 data and the red dot represents the 2021 data. And as you can see here, if the arrow mark is towards the right, then that means the mean score has increased. If it is towards the left, then it means the mean score has declined. And we can see that except for English in class 10, in all other areas, the mean marks score has declined. In English in class 10, the score has increased from 253 to 277. But in other areas, the scores have declined mainly due to pandemic and the lockdowns. Apart from this, there are also two other major findings of this NAS 2021. First one is that the schools in rural areas scored lower than their urban counterparts and this can be attributed to many reasons, especially the unavailability of digital education because in many of the rural areas, internet connection and internet penetration was a major problem. And another important finding is that female students have performed better than male students. So these are the three important findings of NAS 2021. Again, these are data that you can use in your main answer writing for substantiating uh, any point regarding the effects of pandemic. So with this news article discussion, we are moving to the next session of practice questions discussion. As I said during the article's discussion where we saw about Aadhaar number, I said that there are previous equations in this area. And today I have taken two previous equations in this part. Let us take the first one. This one was asked in the year 2018. It is a two statement question. First statement is Aadhaar card can be used as a proof of citizenship or domicile. This statement is incorrect. During discussion itself, we clearly saw that Aadhaar cannot be used as a proof of citizenship or domicile. Rather, it is just a proof of identity. So, statement 1 is incorrect. Now, let us come to the statement 2. Once issued, Aadhaar number cannot be deactivated or omitted by the issuing authority. So even if you are confused whether this statement is right or not, you can assume that it is right based on our discussion. Because during the discussion, we saw that if there is a duplication of other enrollment, then the duplicate will be deleted by the authority. This simply means that other number once issued, it can be omitted. So based on that, we can say this statement is incorrect because it says it cannot be omitted. So remember, other number may be deactivated or permanently omitted by the UIDAI and this is as per other act regulations. So both the statements are incorrect here. But look at the question, it asks for the correct statements. So be careful while answering the question because the correct answer is option D, neither 1 nor 2. Now the second previous question that I have taken is this one which was asked in the 2020. It is a four statement question. See, this question can be answered if you follow the Supreme Court's judgment regarding Aadhaar, the judgment which came in the year 2018. This question is entirely based on that judgment. Let us take up each statement now. First statement, Aadhaar metadata cannot be stored for more than three months. See, metadata is a set of data that describes and gives information about other data. Now, regarding this, the Supreme Court judgment stated that Aadhaar metadata, including the authentication data of citizens who have enrolled for Aadhaar, cannot be retained beyond six months. So, here the period is six months and not three months. And that is why statement one is incorrect. So, from this, we can eliminate options A and D. 
Now, if you come to the second statement, it says state can enter into any contract with private corporations for sharing of other data. Actually, this was the main controversy at that time and the Supreme Court judgment provided a relief in this regard. This provision existed in the other act under section 52. It allowed sharing of data with private entities, but Supreme Court struck down this section 57. So after that, the private bodies like telecom companies, e-commerce firms cannot ask for uh, biometric and other data from consumers for their services. So statement two is actually correct, which mentions states cannot enter into any contract with private corporations for sharing of other data. So the moment you know statement two is correct, you can easily arrive at the correct answer, which is option B, two and four only. Now from this, we can say that statement four is correct which is other is mandatory for getting benefits funded out of Consolidated Fund of India. Now, during discussion, we said obtaining other is voluntary and not mandatory. But if you want to get benefits that are funded out of Consolidated Fund of India, then other number is mandatory. Actually, this is provided under Section 7 of the Aadhaar Act of 2016. And this Section 7 was challenged in the Supreme Court. And uh, Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of this section. And that is why it is mandatory. Now, statement 3 is incorrect because when Supreme Court struck down section 57, which we already saw, saying that private entities cannot ask for biometric and other data from consumers for their services. At that time, IRDI also issued a advisory stating that insurers should not mandatorily seek other data from the customers. But this does not mean that they cannot accept other as one of the documents for KYC, but they cannot mandatorily ask it. If it is offered voluntarily by the policy holder or by the proposer, then it can be received by the insurer. And that is why statement 3 is incorrect. So the correct answer is option B, 2 and 4 only. So these were the two previous questions based on Aadhaar. Now let us take up one practice question. I have given a two statement question here. First statement, Aadhaar is a 13 digit individual identification number issued by Unique Identification Authority of India. Here, two parts are there in this question. First part is, it is a 13 digit individual identification number. It is incorrect because Aadhaar is a 12 digit individual identification number. But the second half is correct. So statement one is incorrect as a whole. If we come to statement two, children can be enrolled for Aadhaar right from birth and biometrics are taken for them. This statement is incorrect. Here also, the first half is correct. Children can be enrolled for Aadhaar right from their birth. But the second half is incorrect because for children who are below 5 years, biometrics will not be captured because they are still in the development stage. So here also, both the statements are incorrect and the question asks you to choose the incorrect statements only. So the correct answer is option C, both 1 and 2. Now let us take up the next practice question. It is regarding the National Assessment Survey 2021. First statement, it is conducted by the University Grants Commission. See, if you know that this is not a university level assessment, rather it is a school level survey, then you can immediately say the statement is incorrect. And the moment you realize this, you can eliminate options A, B and C and you can arrive at the correct answer 2 and 3 only without even knowing whether statement 3 is right or not. Because it is a data based statement and it is quite difficult to remember such kinds of data. So that is why we say if you see any topic in the news, you should know the basics about it because if you know the basics, most often you can use your elimination technique and you can arrive at the correct answer in the prelims. So two and three are correct. Two states the objective of this assessment and statement three is correct because if you take the data point here, you can see that everything is in blue color which means there is a increase in the mean scores in English and we saw that English is monitored only in class 10. Now let us take up the next question. So now let us take up this question. It asks which of the following are mosquito borne diseases? The options given are Zika, Leishmaniasis, West Nile fever, yellow fever, Japanese encephalitis. So from today's discussion you can see three should be an answer that is West Nile fever. So you can eliminate option B. Now you should know that all these are vector borne diseases. Vector means the living organisms that can transmit infectious pathogens between humans or from animals to humans. So therefore, the vector-borne diseases are those illnesses which are caused by the parasites, viruses and bacteria which are transmitted by these vectors. So the vectors transmit the parasites, viruses and bacteria which causes illnesses. So here, we are particularly in this question, we want to know about the vector mosquito. 
Among these, Leishmaniasis is the one which is not caused by the vector mosquito. Leishmaniasis is caused by sand flies. These sand flies transmit a parasite which causes the Leishmaniasis disease. Other than that, the remaining, that is the Zika, West Nile fever, yellow fever, Japanese encephalitis, all these are caused by mosquito only. But there are different kinds of mosquitoes which transmits uh, these diseases. You should also know that. For example, chikungunya, dengue, lymphatic filariasis, then yellow fever, Zika, all these are caused by Aedes mosquito. On the other hand, malaria and lymphatic filariasis is caused by Anopheles mosquito. And uh, as we saw during discussion, West Nile fever is caused by Culex mosquito. Even Japanese encephalitis is caused by Culex mosquito only. Now here you can notice that lymphatic filariasis is caused by all these three types of mosquito. Now you can also see what type of pathogen they transfer. The Culex mosquito in case of West Nile fever transfers a virus. Whereas in case of malaria, the Anopheles mosquito transfers a parasite. So you should also know this difference. This grouping is important because there is already a question in prelims. As you can see here, the question talks about Zika virus disease. And in the first statement, you can see that it mentions in tropical regions, Zika virus disease is transmitted by the same mosquito that transmits dengue. And just now we saw that this is correct. Both are caused by Aedes mosquito. So this grouping is important from prelims perspective. Just know that. So the correct answer to this question is option D, 1, 3, 4 and 5 only. Now let us take up this next question. It is about the unicorns. First statement, only privately owned startups can become unicorns. This statement is correct. We saw this during discussion itself. Second statement, India is gradually transitioning from the age of unicorns to the age of decacorns. See, during discussion we saw that unicorn is a term given only to startups who have valuation of over a billion. That is over one billion. So here the uni in unicorn denotes one. Now, when such startups exceed the valuation of $10 billion, they are grouped under the term decacorn. It could also be called as super unicorn. Now, some of the examples of decacorn includes, you know, SpaceX, Dropbox, etc. And India is gradually transitioning from the age of unicorns to the age of decacorns. It is true. See, already as of May 2022, 47 companies worldwide have achieved the decacorn status. And in India, we have four of them. They are Flipkart, Baiju's, Nike, and Swiggy. They have been added to the Decacon list. So statement 2 is also correct. But be careful, here the question asks you to choose the incorrect statements. Therefore, the correct answer to this question is option D, neither 1 nor 2. Now let us take up the quiz question for today. This question is based on our bail discussion. Read each statement carefully and you can post the correct answer in the comment section. I'll tell you whether your answer is right or not. Today we do not have a mains question. So with this we have come to the end of Hindi news analysis for the date 30th of May 2022. In 5 days you have prelims exam. So those who are giving attempt this year all the best. If you like this video don't forget to like, comment and share. And also subscribe to our channel for receiving regular updates. Thank you.